Good evening. It is 8 o'clock Central Standard Time down here in Austin, Texas. And um, we're going into May now. And I started the Shelter in Place Story Time. Boy, I think it was back in March. So we're going into our, well, probably our second month, really. But it's a plan, a weekly get together every Sunday evening in order to relax together. And uh, it took me a minute, but um, I love acronyms. And I love acronyms. I love anachronisms and acronyms. Um, shelter in place, SIP. Shelter in place, story time, SIPs. So it's important we take our SIPs together. That will help us get through this difficult time. So I hope you have a beverage and you have a comfortable place to shelter. Uh, hopefully you've got company, you've got somebody you can tolerate with you. And if not, you're stuck with your own thoughts. Sometimes more difficult. I hope the volume's all right. I'm going to check before I get going. All right, I'm maxed out. I'm going to talk in a normal voice, continue to breathe normally. And uh, tonight's theme I thought would be appropriate, what with uh, the usual chaos in our society. Welcome everybody, Tom, Trish, Lauren. And, um, you know, uh, I always think, wow, science. But this is like people like H.G. Wells and uh, all those early sociologists. Thorsten Veblen, one of my favorites, thought, you know, once people get used to science, we can have a rational society in which we set goals, rational goals, and achieve them together through our collective human, you know, um, stick to -itiveness. And, of course, um, we are masters. Our, our technological, probably, expertise is limited to the circular firing squad. But we're going to keep going. And uh, so I thought tonight's theme would be Americana in all its glory. And I've got a, a various selections, and uh, but that is the underlying theme. I think I'm going to start. Actually, I'm going to start with this. Um, uh, I happen to have some uh, Library of America volumes. <laughs> People are always saying, "What am I reading from?" I know this is backwards, but uh, you can see it's um, reporting World War II. And it's uh, various uh, journalists reporting all through the war years. And uh, here's a pretty good one. Um, I thought it was timely in that it's about rationing in 1942, food shortages and, and the bureaucracy of the food chain within a, uh, a wartime situation, which uh, you could see the metaphorical implications for our time that we're in. War on, what are we uh, fighting? We have nothing to fear but ourselves, mostly. Um, war on nature, I don't know how we're defining it, but uh, definitely it feels like you know some kind of a war effort and we have to make sacrifices. So I'm going to start with this, and uh, this is by war reporter Brendan Gill. I think this was an article in 1942 in The New Yorker, and uh, it's called <clears throat> The Home Front, Rationing, 1942. X, B, and chiefly A. Okay, are we all tucked in? You got your blankie and your cocktail? And uh, we're ready to go. Tuesday afternoon last week, I saw one of the country's 8,000 ration boards at work. This particular board, which has jurisdiction over sugar, gas, new tires, and the recapping of old ones, is in White Plains, but it is unquestionably a good deal like the board in Rye or Greenwich or New Rochelle. Last week, it was occupied almost entirely with listening to gas rationing appeals. Its behavior struck me as peculiarly American and somehow cheering and perhaps worth telling about. The White Plains Ration Board occupies two dusty rooms on the second floor of an old high school building on Main Street. According to a sign tacked on a door at the head of the stairs, the board meets every afternoon from 2 to 4, Monday through Friday. 
It was shortly before two when I arrived, and the door was locked. I rapped, and a good-looking young woman opened it. <clears throat> it seemed to me that she glanced rather apprehensively up and down the empty corridor. When I introduced myself, she smiled in relief. Come along in, she said. I'm Mrs. Christensen. I guess you'd call me a sort of secretary to the board. When I heard your knock, I was afraid the rush was beginning already. Yesterday, we had to handle a couple of hundred people in two hours. I told Mrs. Christensen I was sorry to bother her, but she invited me to sit down. Shoving the white stacks of paper covering her desk to one side, she said, Say, I'm glad to forget about this for a while. I never did any bookkeeping before in my life, just legal typing, and it isn't so easy to keep things straight. You see, some of our reports have to be sent to country county headquarters, some to Albany, others to Washington. All reports have to be typed in duplicate, triplicate, or quadruplicate, and they all have to be kept on file here. That's the catch. So far, we've only got two little files for the whole job. Two files, one typewriter, and one telephone. I think I need a sip. Shelter in place story time, sips. <clears throat> Welcome, Kurt, Paul, Joel. Very good. This is a story, in, just case, in case you come in late, I'll keep um, letting people know. Uh, this is a story of reporting rationing during 1942. I asked her how she ha happened to take on the job. I volunteered, she answered. I hadn't worked since I got married, but I wanted to help. You mean you're handling this job without pay? I asked. Of course, she said, just like the members on the board. Lately, we've been allowed one salaried clerk to help us, but he's only paid about 25 a week. Mrs. Christensen typed a few reports while I wandered about, <clears throat> waiting for the board to convene. In the first room, there were only Mrs. Christensen's desk and chair, a long table and three chairs for the board, and two long wooden benches against the walls. There was nothing in the other room but some loosely piled pamphlets, sugar ration books, and gas ration cards. It wasn't long before the members of the board began to arrive, and Mrs. Christensen introduced me as they came in. The chairman is Mr. Chauncey Griffin, a prominent real estate man and a former mayor of White Plains. Mr. Griffin is white-haired and handsome and talks with a pleasant country club accent. The two other members of the board are Edward Shermer, a director of several banks, and Thomas Holden, a lawyer. At two o'clock sharp, the board clerk, a former bakery salesman named Mr. Miller, arrived and Mrs. Christensen opened the hall door. As a queue of men and women moved timidly forward, I assured Mr. Griffin that I would not mention the names of all those appearing before the board. The three members of the board, who sat only a couple of feet apart at the same table, heard cases individually, so there was a certain amount of confusion. The first appeal to which I listened was that of a middle-aged man who was in a state of great excitement. He appeared before Mr. Griffin. My God, he said, leaning over Mr. Griffin's desk, it would buy two bonds. It would help win the war, and I've got to give it to the railroad. He spread his hands, palms up. Where's the sense in that? Now, now, Mr. Griffin said, what would buy two bonds? The price of the railroad tickets. My wife and I, if we want to go down to Maine to see her family, we always hop in the car. It costs five dollars, maybe, to get there by car. Now they give us an A card and say, listen, you go by train. But by train it costs up to forty dollars. Thirty-five dollars wasted. That's practically two bonds. Mr. Griffin shook his head and said, I'm sorry, but you go by train. The man began to argue, and Mr. Griffin, looking beyond him, said, You might just remember that it takes 50 gallons of gas to warm up a bomber, and we need a lot of bombers. Next, please. The next petitioner was a White Plains man who had come up by train from Florida, where he had found a war job for himself in order to sell his house in White Plains and drive his car back to Florida. His car, however, had not yet been registered for 1942. Mr. Griffin pointed out to him that he would have to register his car before a gas ration card could be issued to him. 
Then he would be given a B3 card, entitling him to 57 gallons of gas, which would be enough, probably, to carry him over halfway to Florida. He would have to stop in some town along the route when his gas ran low and apply to the ration board there for another B3 card to carry him the rest of the way. The man thanked Mr. Griffin, and a woman took his place before the desk. How's everybody doing? I just want to check in. Jim, Betsy, Javier, Robin. Um, I'm reading a story uh, published in the New Yorker in 1942 about uh, rationing boards and when people have to come to the board to appeal their whatever, the ration situation. Timely, right, for our Americana theme. And I hope you realize I dressed appropriately for Americana. <clears throat> All right. Uh, a woman took his place before the desk. She said rather archly, My dear Mr. Griffin, is this where you ration everything? Everything but the ladies, madam, Mr. Griffin said gallantly. The government hasn't let us do that yet. The woman fluttered her eyelids. Evidently, everything was going to be just as she had hoped it would be. Well, I've got an A card, she said, but I think I deserve better. You see, my dear mother's 80, and she's had a stroke. The only real pleasure she gets out of life is a little ride every evening in the fine summer weather. And I'm afraid we won't be able to take our little rides unless you give me a B3 card or perhaps an X. His air of gallantry still intact, Mr. Griffin said, I happen to have a mother, too, who's over 80 and has had a stroke. She likes to go out riding whenever she can, too but she'll have to make a certain number of sacrifices, just like the rest of us. She'll have to manage on an A card. The woman stopped smiling. But of course, an A card isn't enough, she said. It may be the death of my poor mother. All right, Mr. Griffin said, standing up as a hint that the interview was about over. You go out and get an affidavit from your mother's physician swearing that unless she can ride a minimum of 40 or 50 miles a week, every week, she'll die. Then you can come back here and get more gas. I walked over to Mr. Shermer's place at the table. He was apparently having some difficulty with an Italian workman. Behind me, I could hear Mrs. Christensen dealing with an old man who was asking for 33 pounds of sugar for a church supper. And in another part of the room, the clerk, who wandered around because he had no place to sit down, was filling out an application for a set of recaps for a man who scraped floors. The room was filled with people by now, most of them looking amiable enough, but a few staring at one another in mutual suspicion. I overheard one man ask, of no one in particular, Well, did you think we'd ever come to this in the good old USA? Mr. Shermer was saying to the Italian, Take it easy, one step at a time. You say you work for the New York Central? That's it, that's right. You make repairs along the tracks from White Plains to Crestwood? That means you spend the day riding back and forth on the different trains, doesn't it? You just get off wherever there's a length of track that needs repairing? Sure, but at night, after midnight, is no trains. And suppose it rains. Suppose I got to get up emergency. I got to fix the tracks. Then I need a gas for my car. But you told me you lived a mile from the White Plains Station. You can't drive your car up and down the tracks. An A-card ought to get you back and forth to work as often as you like. The two men had begun to sweat. Mr. Shermer called to a well-dressed man he evidently knew who was seated, waiting his turn, on one of the long wooden benches against the wall. The man came up and asked the workman one or two questions in Italian, then exploded into what sounded like a series of unforgivable insults. The workman's head lowered and his hands dropped to his sides. Then he got up and walked quietly out of the room. What was that about? Mr. Shermer asked the man who had helped him out. He was just trying to get away with murder, the man said. He'd heard about somebody else on the road who got a B3, so he wanted one. I asked him what kind of a country he thought this was. I asked how he'd like it back in Posilipo. <laughs> Just then, a short, thin man with a waxed mustache, a dentist it turned out, hurried into the room and threw down a salmon pink card on Mr. Shermer's desk. I never asked for the X card, the man said almost fiercely. 
I don't want it. I won't touch it. For God's sake, tear it up. Mr. Shermers wiped his forehead and said, Take it easy, one step at a time. How did you happen to get this card? I went over to the nearest school the night they started handing them out, and one of the teachers said to me, Why, you deserve an X card. Doctor, if anybody does. And she made me take it. I tell you, she forced it on me. Mr. Shermer smiled. Cheer up, he said. You're not the only one. A lot of dentists and a lot of nurses and a whole pack of cops and other city employees got X cards they weren't entitled to. He patted a thick envelope on the table. We've been calling them in, and over 50 have been turned back voluntarily so far. What kind of a card do you think you ought to have? The dentist hesitated. Mr. Shermer said, I guess we'd better make it an A card, hadn't we? Yes, sir, the dentist said. I guess maybe we had. Okay. How's everybody doing? Stephanie, Gina, Barbara, welcome. Um, in case anybody's lost, this is a news reporting from 1942 about rationing, and uh, they had these cards that would entitle you to certain types of uh, amounts, gas and food, A card, B card, X card, that kind of stuff. So we haven't gotten to that yet, but um, I know that HEB is r still rationing um, hand sanitizer and toilet paper and now possibly meat. You can only get two pounds of meat per visit. Boy, that would just get me to the sidewalk and I'd have to go back for my other extra pounds of meat. Uh, but anyway, I digress. Our theme tonight is Americana. We're all in it together, whatever it is. All right. Um, Mr. Shermer picked up an A card. Say, Shine, he called over to Mr. Griffin, who was obviously known to his colleagues as Shine. What the devil have you done with my pen? Mr. Griffin raised his eyebrows. Why, Eddie, I don't know what you mean, he said in a tone of mock injury. I wouldn't borrow that cheap little pen on a bet. Apparently this was an old and familiar argument, for Mrs. Christensen walked over and searched the drifts of paper on Mr. Griffin's desk until she found a pen under a corner of the blotter. In a stage whisper, she said to me, Imagine only one pen among the three of them. They're just like three kids. Leaving Mr. Shermer shaking his head in self-pity and filling out an A card for the dentist, I moved over to Mr. Holden. A small, middle-aged woman wearing silver-framed pince-nez was speaking rapidly, and I thought a trifle desperately, into Mr. Holden's ear. Mr. Holden was nodding, his eyes nearly closed. In the first place, you see... Oops, sorry, wrong voice. In the first place, you see, I heard the woman say, my two children and I have just driven north to spend the summer in Rhode Island. Yesterday, I left the children with some relatives out in Quahog, Long Island, while I did some necessary business here in White Plains. Now I have to drive back to Quahog to pick up my, the children and drive on to Rhode Island. That'll be over 350 miles in two days, and all I have is an A card. My tank is about half a gallon left in it now. At least the needle's been shivering over zero for miles and miles. Mr. Holden nodded gently. There's nothing to worry about, young lady, he said. We'll see that you get what gas you need. Mr. Holden made this sound like a sort of divine benefaction. Won't we, Eddie? Mr. Holden asked turning to the other members of the board. Won't we shine? Mr. Shermer and Mr. Griffin nodded. You'll just have to sign a statement explaining why you need the gas, Mr. Holden went on. When you reach Rhode Island, we'd like you to mail back to us the supplemental B3 card I'm going to give you. He fingered the pocket of his coat. I seem to have left my pen at home. Eddie, would it be too much trouble? The woman took off her pince-nez and smiled. She opened her purse. I think I have a pen, she said. You can use mine if you like. When I returned to Mr. Griffin, he had just called up a young man who had been nervously pacing the room. I'm a manufacturer's salesman, the young man said. My territory's Connecticut, eastern New York, and New Jersey. I've built up a pretty good business in the last four or five years. I'm married. I got two kids. Mr. Griffin played with a paperclip. No reason you can't get as much gas as you need to carry on your business, he said. I suppose you've used up most of your first B3 card with a territory as big as that. Yes, sir. A boy and a girl. 
The young man answered excitedly, We've just bought a house on the FHA. We have to pay for it by the month. Mr. Griffin looked as if he thought the young man might break down. Listen, he said, there's nothing for you to worry about. Our ruling, straight from the OPA, is that all you have to do to get another B3 card is to get your boss to write us a letter. Have him sign his name to what you've told me, and you're all set. Yes, sir, the young man said. That's what I told my boss, but he won't listen to me. He's made a ruling of his own that we must sell our stuff by phone or not at all. That's not so bad for the other salesman because I'm the only one working outside New York City. My boss says he won't ask any favors for me. He says he loves his country. He says I ought to learn to be a patriot. Mr. Griffin said, well, we have a ruling and we're supposed to stick to it. No letter, no gas. He threw the paper clip on the floor and picked up Mr. Shermer's pen. By God, he said, you just give me your boss's name, and I'll write him a letter. I may not be acting altogether according to Hoyle, but I think you can stop worrying. As the young man, having given the name, grinned and left, I said to Mr. Griffin, Isn't it odd that no commuters have bothered you today? I expected them to make more trouble than anyone else. Commuters aren't so bad, Mr. Griffin said. You see, most of them fought it out with the teachers when they got their cards. They are reconciled by now to buses and walking and doubling up. They grouse, but they don't ask the impossible. That's been our experience and the experience of all the other boards in the country, though we've heard of a couple of odd cases. There's a lawyer who practices not only in New York, but also in the town where he has his country home. He's elderly, a widower, and has no one to take care of him but his staff of servants. He claims he needs his car to drive himself and the staff back and forth from town every week that he'd go bankrupt if he had to send his, the servants by train. At his age, it's obvious that he can't just picnic out. And he's working in both places, you see. It's a risky decision, but I guess he deserves a B3 card. I heard a, of a case, too, where a man managed to get B3 cards for three of his cars and only A cards for the remaining two, and he practically tore his ration board apart. Mr. Griffin tossed me a letter. We get a few of these every day, but not as many as you might think. I glanced at the letter. It began, Dear Mr. Griffin, I am delighted to know that a man of your integrity and high standing in this community should be chairman of our ration board. It is certainly a lucky thing for all of us that a man of your caliber is willing to serve. I am writing to explain that I'm afraid that our A card isn't quite suitable for us. I must take Evangeline to school each morning, dot, dot, dot. Mr. Griffin made a face. Handing me another letter, he said, And we also get a few like this. It read, Dear Mr. Griffin, I hope you will check up on all drivers. While our boys are fighting and dying all over the world, I can't see why anyone should knowingly waste a fraction of an inch of rubber or a single gallon of gas. The letter was signed, Broken Hearted. Mr. Griffin looked apologetic as I finished reading the letter. Sort of emotional, of course, he said. Some soldier's mother, I suppose. He leaned forward over his desk toward the remaining petitioners on the benches. Next complaint, he said a bit severely. The New Yorker, June 13, 1942. I hope you enjoyed that. A little uh, glimpse into our nation's past when we've had to deal with shortages and how people react. Um, now, where shall we go? Where shall we go? How's everybody doing? Barbara, Nathan, Rusty, thanks. Um, feel free to uh, drop in comments if you want to know anything about the stories or you have suggestions of other stories or um i decided i'm going to try to be a little bit more thematic and uh i'm not sure what that will do but my theme is americana and uh i don't know i, I don't have any hopes i just have ideas <laughs> so it's not like i hope we're going to galvanize and really get you know to see what we all share in this crisis, how we all have something in common and we can set aside our differences and work together, you know, and really rise, you know, our better angels, as they say, and, and work together and let go of our petty differences. I don't think that's going to happen. But we can at least, you know, maybe make an attempt to look at what previous generations did. 
and you know, sort of go, maybe we'll be a little bit ashamed of ourselves in if we imagine our ancestors looking on, going, you know, I had to fight buffalo in my underwear or whatever the problem was back then. Um, you know, and, and you're worried about not having two pounds of meat from H-E-B, whatever. But uh, everybody have a sip because it's Sips Night. Shelter in place story time. Okay, I'm going to jump. And um, let's see, I think I'm going to stay in the past. <laughs> That's what people say about me. You're living in the past. Um, but I'm going to go to Willa Cather, a great American writer. From the, I've got her uh, book. This is um, uh, novels and stories, um, Library of Congress, my my own volume. And uh, this, for some reason, it resonated, and it kind of reminded me. I think it was two weeks ago. I uh, read um, Kate Chopin. I read a story by her, which was set around early 1900s. Carmen James, um, and uh, this is. Um, set also, you know, whenever. And certainly in the past, but it resonates. <clears throat> this is uh, set out on the plains. And Willa Cather, and it's called A Wagner, or Wagner, Matinee. I received one morning a letter written in pale ink on glassy blue-lined notepaper and bearing the postmark of a little Nebraska village. This communication, worn and rubbed, looking as though it had been carried for some days in a coat pocket that was none too clean, was from my Uncle Howard, and informed me that his wife had been left a small legacy by a bachelor relative who had recently died, and that it would be necessary for her to go to Boston to attend to the settling of the estate. He requested me to meet her at the station and render her whatever services might be necessary. On examining the date indicated as that of her arrival, I found it no later than tomorrow. He had characteristically delayed writing until, had I been away from home for a day, I must have missed the good woman altogether. The name of my aunt Georgiana called up not only her own figure, at once pathetic and grotesque, but opened before my feet a gulf of recollection so wide and deep that as the letter dropped from my hand, <clears throat> I felt suddenly a stranger to all the present conditions of my existence, wholly ill at ease and out of place amid the familiar surroundings of my study. I became, in short, the gangling farmer boy my aunt had known, scourged with chillblains and bashfulness, my hands cracked and sore from the corn husking. I felt the knuckles of my thumb tentatively, as though they were raw again. I sat again before her parlor organ, fumbling the scales with my stiff red hands, while she, beside me, made canvas mittens for the huskers. The next morning, after preparing my landlady somewhat, I set out for the station. When the train arrived, I had some difficulty in finding my aunt. She was the last of the passengers to alight, and it was not until I got her into the carriage that she seemed to really to recognize me. She had come all the way in a day coach. Her linen duster had become black with soot, and her black bonnet gray with dust during the journey. When we arrived at my boarding house, the landlady put her to bed at once, and I did not see her again until the next morning. Whatever shock Mrs. Springer experienced at my aunt's appearance, she considerately concealed. As for myself, I saw my aunt's misshapen figure with that feeling of awe and respect with which we behold explorers who have left their ears and fingers north of Franz Joseph Land, or their health somewhere along the upper Congo. My aunt Georgiana had been a music teacher at the Boston Conservatory somewhere back in the latter 60s. One summer, while visiting in the little village among the Green Mountains where her ancestors had dwelt for generations, she had kindled the callow fancy of the most idle and shiftless of all the village lads, 
and had conceived for this Howard Carpenter one of those extravagant passions which a handsome country boy of twenty-one sometimes inspires in an angular, spectacled woman of thirty. When she returned to her duties in Boston, Howard followed her, and the upshot of this inexplicable infatuation was that she eloped with him, eluding the reproaches of her family and the criticisms of her friends by going with him to the Nebraska frontier. Carpenter, who of course had no money, had taken a homestead in Red Willow County, 50 miles from the railroad. There they had measured off their quarter section themselves by driving across the prairie in a wagon to the wheel of which they had tied a red cotton handkerchief and counting off its revolutions. They built a dugout in the red hillside, one of those cave dwellings whose inmates so often reverted to primitive conditions. Their water they got from the lagoons where the buffalo drank, and their slender stock of provisions was always at the mercy of bands of roving Indians. For thirty years my aunt had not been further than fifty miles from the homestead. But Mrs. Springer knew nothing of all this, and must have been considerably shocked at what was left of my kinswoman. Beneath the soiled linen duster, which on her arrival was the most conspicuous feature of her costume, she wore a black stuff dress, whose ornamentation showed that she had surrendered herself unquestioningly into the hands of a country dressmaker. My poor aunt's figure, however, would have presented astonishing difficulties to any dressmaker. Originally stooped, her shoulders were now almost bent together over her sunken chest. She wore no stays, and her gown, um, sorry, which trailed unevenly behind, rose in a sort of peak over her abdomen. She wore ill-fitting false teeth, and her skin was as yellow as a Mongolian's from constant exposure to a pitiless wind and to the alkaline water, which hardens the most transparent cuticle into a sort of flexible leather. Mmm. Makes you want to move to Nebraska. Uh, just pause to say hi, Aaron, Bill, Dennis, thanks for checking in. Thanks for being part of this historic procedure, <laughs> that this endeavor we are engaged in of uh, getting through each week together. Um, I'm reading uh, Willa Cather's um, A Wagner Matinee, and this aunt has to come back east from Nebraska, and her nephew is hosting her. I owed to this woman most of the good that ever came my way in my boy boyhood, and had a reverential affection for her. During the years when I was riding herd for my uncle, my aunt, after cooking the three meals, the, the first of which was ready at six o'clock in the morning, and putting the six children to bed, would often stand until midnight at her ironing board, with me at the kitchen table beside her, hearing me recite Latin declensions and conjugations, gently shaking me when my drowsy head sank down over a page of irregular verbs. It was to her, at her ironing or mending, that I read my first Shakespeare, and her old textbook on mythology was the first that ever came into my empty hands. She taught me my scales and exercises, too, on the little parlor organ which her husband had bought her after fifteen years, during which she had not so much as seen any instrument but an accordion that belonged to one of the Norwegian farmhands. She would sit beside me by the hour, darning and counting, while I struggled with the joyous farmer, but she seldom talked to me about music, and I understood why. She was a pious woman. She had the consolations of religion, and to her at least, her martyrdom was not wholly sordid. Once, when I had been doggedly beating out some easy passages from an old score of Urianth, I had found among her music books, she came up to me and, putting her hands over my eyes, gently drew my head back upon her shoulder, saying tremulously, Don't love it so well, Clark, or it may be taken from you. Oh, dear boy, pray that whatever your sacrifice may be, it be not that. When my aunt appeared on the morning after her arrival, she was still in a semi-somnambulant semi state. 
She seemed not to realize that she was in the city where she had spent her youth, the place longed for hungrily half a lifetime. She had been so wretchedly train sick throughout the journey that she had no recollection of anything but her discomfort, and to all intents and purposes there were but a few hours of nightmare between the farm in Red Willow County and my study on Newbury Street. I had planned a little pleasure for her that afternoon to re repay her for some of the glorious moments she had given me when we used to milk together in the straw-thatched cow's shed, and she, because I was more than usually tired, or because her husband had spoken sharply to me, would tell me of the splendid performance of the Huguenots she had seen in Paris in her youth. At two o'clock, the symphony orchestra was to give a Wagner program, and I intended to take my aunt. Though, as I conversed with her, I grew doubtful about her enjoyment of it. Indeed, for her own sake, <clears throat> I could only wish her taste for such things quite dead, and the long struggle mercifully ended at last. I suggested our visiting the conservatory and the common before lunch, but she seemed altogether too timid to wish to venture out. She questioned me absently about various changes in the city, but she was chiefly concerned that she had forgotten to leave instructions about feeding half-skimmed milk to a certain weakling calf. Old Maggie's calf, you know, Clark, she explained, evidently having forgotten how long I had been gone away. She was further troubled because she had neglected to tell her daughter about the freshly opened kit of mackerel in the cellar, which would spoil if it were not used directly. I'm just going to stop for a minute to check in. Lois, David, welcome. Shelter in place story time. Everybody have a sip. It's Sips Night. Ah, I hope you had a good week and you're ready for the next one. As I said in a previous episode, it's hard to keep track of the days of the week. Everything is just today, today, today. That's why I do these broadcasts and I do stories on Sunday just to remind myself that it's Sunday. Otherwise, I'd go completely crazy. All right, but not like these characters from Will Cather. They've just got it all together in our, um, uh, what do we call it? Our perusal, our historical viewing of the theme of Americana tonight. All right. The kit of mackerel in the cellar, which would spoil if it were not used directly. I asked her whether she had ever heard any of the Wagnerian operas, and found that she had not, though she was perfectly familiar with their respective situations, and had once possessed the piano score of the Flying Dutchman. I began to think it would have been best to get her back to Red Willow County without waking her, and regretted having suggested the concert. From the time we entered the concert hall, however, she was a trifle less passive and inert, and for the first time seemed to perceive her surroundings. I had felt some trepidation lest she might become aware of the absurdities of her attire, or might experience some painful embarrassment at stepping suddenly into the world to which she had been dead for a quarter of a century. But again I found how superficially I had judged her. She sat looking about her with eyes as impersonal, almost as stony, as those with which the granite Ramses, Ramses in a museum watches the froth and fret that ebbs and flows about his pedestal. The Ramses, like the uh, museum statuary. Separated from it by the lonely stretch of centuries, I have seen this same aloofness in old miners who drift into the Brown Hotel at Denver, their pockets full of bullion, their linen soiled, their haggard faces unshaven, standing in the thronged corridors as solitary as though they were still in a frozen camp on the Yukon, conscious that certain experiences have isolated them from their fellows by a gulf no haberdasher could bridge. We sat at the extreme left of the first balcony, facing the ark of our own and the balcony above us, veritable hanging gardens, brilliant as tulip beds. 
The matinee audience was made up chiefly of women. One lost the contour of faces and figures, indeed any effect of line whatever, and there was only the color of bodices past counting, the shimmer of fabrics, soft and firm, silky and sheer, red, mauve, pink, blue, lilac, purple, ecru, rose, yellow, cream, and white, all the colors that an impressionist finds in a sunlit landscape, with here and there the dead shadow of a frock coat. My aunt Georgiana regarded them as though they had been so many daubs of tube paint on a palette. When the musicians came out and took their places, she gave a little stir of anticipation and looked with quickening interest down over the rail at that invariable grouping, perhaps the first wholly familiar thing that had greeted her eye since she had left old Maggie and her weakling calf. I could feel how all those details sank into her soul, for I had not forgotten how they had sunk into mine when I came fresh from plowing forever and forever between green aisles of corn, where, as in a treadmill, one might walk from daybreak to dusk without perceiving a shadow of change. The clean profiles of the musicians, the gloss of their linen, the dull black of their coats, the beloved shapes of the instruments, the patches of yellow light thrown by the green-shaded lamps on the smooth, varnished bellies of the cellos and the bass viols in the rear, the restless, wind-tossed forest of fiddle-necks and bows. I recalled how, in the first orchestra I had ever heard, those long bow strokes seemed to draw the heart out of me as a conjurer's stick reels out yards of paper ribbon from a hat. Greetings, speaking of violins, greetings to Roberto and David, la trompeta. We got some musicians in the house tonight, and this is uh, about watching a Wagner matinee. The first number was the Tannhauser Overture. When the horns drew out the first strain of the Pilgrim's Chorus, my Aunt Georgiana clutched my coat sleeve. Then it was I first realized that for her this broke a silence of thirty years, the inconceivable silence of the plains. With the battle between the two motives, with the frenzy of the Venusberg theme and its ripping of strings, there came to me an overwhelming sense of the waste and wear we are so powerless to combat and I saw again the tall, naked house on the prairie, black and grim as a wooden fortress, the black pond where I had learned to swim, its margin pitted with sun-dried cattle tracks, the rain-gullied clay banks about the naked house, the four dwarf ash seedlings where the dishcloths were always hung to dry before the kitchen door. The world there was the flat world of the ancients, to the east, a cornfield that stretched to, day, to, day, to daybreak. To the west, a corral that reached to sunset. Between the conquests of peace, dearer bought than those of war. Hmm, I like that. The conquests of peace, dearer bought than those of war. Good one. The overture closed. My aunt released my coat sleeve, but she said nothing. She sat staring at the orchestra through a dullness of thirty years, through the films made little by little by each of the three hundred and sixty-five days in every one of them. What, I wondered, did she get from it? She had been a good pianist in her day, I knew, and her musical education had been broader than that of most music teachers of a quarter of a century ago. She had often told me of Mozart's operas and Meyerbeer's, and I could remember hearing her sing, years ago, certain melodies of Verdi's. When I had fallen ill with a fever in her house, she used to sit by my cot in the evening, when the cool night wind blew in through the faded mosquito netting tacked over the window, and I lay watching a certain bright star that burned red above the cornfield, and sing, Home to our mountains, oh, let us return, in a way fit to break the heart of a Vermont boy near dead of homesickness already. A hey, Nicole Tracy. I watched her closely through the prelude to Tristan and Isolde. 
trying vainly to conjecture what that seething turmoil of strings and winds might mean to her, but she sat mutely staring at the violin bows that drove obliquely downward like the pelting streaks of rain in a summer shower. Had this music any message for her? Had she enough left to at all comprehend this power which had kindled the world since she had left it? I was in a fever of curiosity, but Aunt Georgiana sat silent upon her peak in Darien. She preserved this utter immobility throughout the number from the Flying Dutchman, though her fingers worked mechanically upon her black dress as though of themselves they were recalling the piano score they had once played. Poor old hands! They had been stretched and twisted into mere tentacles to hold and lift and knead with, the palm unduly swollen, the fingers bent and knotted, on one of them a thin, worn band that had once been a wedding ring. As I pressed and gently quieted one of those groping hands, I remembered with quivering eyelids their services for me in other days. This is going to make me cry. <sighs> Soon after the tenor began the prize song, I heard a quick drawn breath and turned to my aunt. Her eyes were closed, but the tears were glistening on her cheeks, and I think in a moment more they were in my eyes as well, and mine. <clears throat> it never really died, then, the soul that can suffer so excruciatingly and so interminably. It withers to the outward eye only, like that strange moss which can lie on a dusty shelf half a century and yet, if placed in water, grows green again. She wept so throughout the development and elaboration of the melody. During the intermission, before the second half of the concert, I questioned my aunt and found that the prize song was not new to her. Some years before, there had drifted to the farm in Red Willow County a young German, a tramp cowpuncher, who had sung in the chorus at Beirut when he was a boy, along with the other peasant boys and girls. Of a Sunday morning, he used to sit on his gingham-sheeted bed in the hands' bedroom, which opened um, off the kitchen, cleaning the leather of his boots and saddle, singing the prize song, while my aunt went about her work in the kitchen. She had hovered about him until she had prevailed upon him to join the country church, though his sole fitness for this step in so far as I could gather, lay in his boyish face and his possession of this divine melody. Shortly afterward, he had gone to town on the 4th of July, been drunk for several days, lost his money at a faro table, ridden a saddled Texan steer on a bet, and disappeared with a fractured collarbone. All this my aunt told me huskily, wanderingly, as though she were talking in the weak lapses of illness. Well, we have come to better things than the old Trovatore, at any rate, Aunt Georgie, I queried with a well-meant effort at jocularity. Her lip quivered, and she hastily put her handkerchief up to her mouth. From behind it, she murmured, And you have been hearing this ever since you left me, Clark? Her question was the gentlest and saddest of reproaches. The second half of the program consisted of four numbers from the ring, and closed with Siegfried's funeral march. My aunt wept quietly, but almost continuously, as a shallow vessel overflows in a rainstorm. From time to time, her dim eyes looked up at the lights which studded the ceiling, burning softly under their dull glass globes. Doubtless, they were stars in truth to her. I was still perplexed as to what measure of musical comprehension was left to her, she who had heard nothing but the singing of gospel hymns at Methodist services in the square frame schoolhouse on section 13 for so many years. I was wholly unable to gauge how much of it had been dissolved in soap suds or worked into bread or milked into the bottom of a pail. The deluge of sound poured on and on. I never knew what she found in the shining current of it. I never knew how far it bore her or past what happy islands. 
From the trembling of her face, I could well believe that before the last numbers she had been carried out where the myriad graves are, into the gray, nameless burying grounds of the sea, or into some world of death vaster yet, where from the beginning of the world hope has lain down with hope and dream with dream and, renouncing, slept. The concert was over. The people filed out of the hall, chattering and laughing, glad to relax and find the living, uh, the living level again. But my kinswoman made no effort to rise. The harpist slipped its green felt cover over his instrument. The flute players shook the water from their mouthpieces. The men of the orchestra went out one by one, leaving the stage to the chairs and music stands, empty as a winter cornfield. I spoke to my aunt. She burst into tears and sobbed pleadingly, I don't want to go, Clark. I don't want to go. I understood. For her, just outside the door of the concert hall, lay the black pond with the cattle-tracked bluffs, the tall unpainted house with weather-curled boards, naked as a tower, the crook-backed ash seedlings where the dishcloths hung to dry, the gaunt, molting turkeys picking up refuse about the kitchen door. Bam! Willa. Willa Cathers. A Wagner matinee. Hope you enjoyed that. That, that got me. I'm going to have a sip. Uh, Barry, Tracy, um, welcome everybody. Hope you're doing good. Um, thanks for waving and uh, if you got any comments or anything. But I, if you're just relaxing, I hope the sound of my voice is uh, soothing and entertaining. Slightly hypnotic. That's my goal. <laughs> like a propagandist reading into a microphone. Um, our theme is Americana tonight, and uh, I'm not sure what I mean by that, except that um, it's a term that's thrown around. It's a radio term, you know, for uh, a certain genre of music, which um, usually involves acoustic guitars and whiny voices. But, you know, I'm not going to judge. As a saxophone player, I try to stay outside the fray. But I think Americana is a good term to describe the confused mix of American identity that has a veneer of some kind of order over it. But really, these little these crises remind us that it's up to us to maintain the order. We can't depend on jangly guitars and, you know, easy rhymes. <laughs> Wash your hands. Um... So anyway, that's kind of Americana to me. And uh, in that vein, I'm going to read an article, and I need to set it up a little bit. It's by a very good uh, music critic, Simon Frith, and it's from this book, Music for Pleasure, backwards. Um, and uh, so it's dated because he's, he's um, you know, writing, I think, early 80s. So a lot has gone on, but um, a lot of what he writes is he's pointing out these sort of trends and themes in uh, pop, pop culture and pop music that um, the themes go on, the, the artists come and go, the particularities come and go, but the themes go on. Much like American history in general, you know, oh, uh, racism, we used to have a problem with that, didn't we? You know, back in the 19th century. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's like we think that stuff is over, but it just takes new shapes. And, and uh, I always think, Better to look than to look away. But, you know, that's easy for me to say because I'm just sax player sitting in my little bubble, self-made bubble. Anyway, um, this is an article that, and it's really about the idea of authenticity, which I think goes with Americana. Like, what is authentic to us? What is sort of cultural truth to us in... Uh, in some kind of national identity, blah, blah, blah. So he's, you know, I think he's English, but um, he's writing about Bruce Springsteen, who's, you know, held up as this icon of um, American identity and these, but has um, 
always been somewhat a figure of um, controversy as far as he represents authenticity, but is he authentic and and is it authenticity uh, in music? Is that something that you as a listener determines? And so if it if it touches you, then that's all that matters. Or is it a marketing strategy? Or is it something where it's up to the artist to persevere and maintain whatever their identity is and not be swayed or packaged by the industry? All those kind of questions. And I think that's part of um, the cultural discourse that we need to have. So anyway, hope you enjoyed this. It's called The Real Thing, Bruce Springsteen by Simon Frith. <clears throat> Introduction. My guess is that by Christmas 1986, Bruce Springsteen was making more money per day than any other pop star, more than Madonna, more than Phil Collins or Mark Knopfler, more than Paul McCartney even. Time calculated that he had earned $7.5 million in the first week of his live LP release. This five-record boxed set went straight to the top of the American LP sales charts, it reputedly sold a million copies on its first day, grossing $50 million out of the gate, and stayed there throughout the Christmas season. It was the nation's best seller in November and December, when more records are sold than in all the other months of the year put together. Even in Britain, where this winter charts are dominated by TV-advertised anthologies, the Springsteen set at 25 pounds brought in more money than the tight-margin single-album compilations. And CBS reckoned they get 42% of their annual sales at Christmas time. Walking through London from Tottenham Court Road down Oxford Street to Piccadilly in early December, passing the three symbols of corporate rock, the Virgin, HMV, and Tower superstores, each claiming to be the biggest record shop in the world, I could only see Springsteen boxes, piled high by the cash desks, the safest stock of the season. <clears throat> I'm going to pause. Thomas, Rosemary, Hector, thanks for checking in. Our theme is Americana. Sales success at this level, those boxes were piled up in Sydney and Toronto too, in shop aisles in Sweden and Denmark, West Germany, Holland and Japan, had a disruptive effect on the rest of the rock process. American television news showed trucks arriving in New York's record stores from the CBS warehouses. They were immediately surrounded by queues, too, and so, in the USA, Springsteen was sold off the back of vans, frantically, like a sudden supply of Levi's in the USSR. Within, a, within hours of its release, the Springsteen box was jamming up CBS's works. In America, the company announced that nothing from its back catalog would be available for four months because all spare capacity had been commandeered for Springsteen, and even then the compact disc version of the box was soon sold out. Not enough, only 300,000 had been manufactured. <coughs> Excuse me. In Europe, the company devoted one of its three pressing plants exclusively to the box, Springsteen dominated the market by being the only CBS product readily available. Whatever the final sales figures turn out to be, and after Christmas, the returns of the boxes from the retailers to CBS were as startling as the original sales, it is already obvious that Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band Live is a phenomenal record, a money-making achievement to be discussed on the same scale as Saturday Night Fever or Michael Jackson's Thriller. Remember, too, that a live record is cheaper to produce than a new studio sound, and Springsteen has already been well rewarded for these songs from the sales of previous discs and the proceeds of sellout tours. Nor did CBS need the expensive trappings or promo videos and press and TV advertising to make this record sell. Because the Springsteen box was an event in itself, the only pop precedent I can think of is the Beatles' 1968 White Album, it generated its own publicity as news. Radio stations competed to play the most tracks for the longest times. Shops competed to give Bruce the most window space. Newspapers competed in speculations about how much money he was really making. The Springsteen box became, in other words, that ultimate object of capitalist fantasy, 
a commodity which sold more and more because it had sold so well already, a product which had to be owned rather than necessarily used. In the end, though, what is peculiar about the Springsteen story is not its mark of a brilliant commercial campaign, but their invisibility. Other superstars put out live sets for Christmas, Queen, for example, and the critics sneer at their opportunism. Other stars resell their old hits, Brian Ferry, for example, and their fans worry about their lack of current inspiration. And in these sorry tales of greed and pride, it is Bruce Springsteen, more often than not, who is the measure of musical integrity, the model of a rock performer who cannot be discussed in terms of financial calculation. In short, the most successful pop commodity of the moment, the Springsteen live set, stands for the principle that music should not be a commodity. It is his very disdain for success that makes Springsteen so successful. It is as if his presence on every fashionable turntable, tape deck, and disc machine, his box on every upmarket living room floor, are what enables an aging, affluent rock generation to feel in touch with its roots. Pretty good, huh? And what matters in this postmodern era is not whether Bruce Springsteen is the real thing, but how he sustains the belief that there are somehow, somewhere, real things to be. <clears throat> False. Consider the following. Bruce Springsteen is a millionaire who dresses as a worker. Work jeans, singlets, a headband to keep his hair from his eyes. These are working clothes, and it is, it is an important part of Springsteen's appeal that we do see him as an entertainer uh, um, working for his living. His popularity is based on his live shows and, more particularly, on their spectacular energy. Springsteen works hard, and his exhaustion on our behalf is visible. He makes music physically as a manual worker. His clothes are straightforwardly practical, sensible, like sports people's clothes. Comfortable jeans worn in for easy movement, a singlet to let the sweat flow free, the mechanic's cloth to wipe his brow. But there is more to these clothes than this. Springsteen wears work clothes even when he is not working. Uh, I just want to give a shout out Tom Stefano. Stefano. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. I'm reading an article, Simon Frith, writing about Springsteen back in the 80s. And the question is authenticity. Uh, Springsteen wears work clothes even when he is not working. His off-stage image, his LP sleeves and interview poses, even the candid off-duty paparazzi shots involve the same down-to-earth practicality. The only time Springsteen was seen to dress up in private was for his wedding. Springsteen doesn't wear the clothes appropriate to his real economic status and resources as compared with other pop stars, but neither does he dress up for special occasions like real workers do. He's never seen flashily attired for a sharp night out. It's as if he can't be seen to be excessive or indulgent except on our behalf as a performer for an audience. For him, there is no division between work and play, between the ordinary and the extraordinary. Because the constructed Springsteen, the star, is presented plain, there can never be a suggestion that this is just an act, as Elvis was an act, as Madonna is. There are no other Springsteens, whether more real or more artificial, to be seen. Springsteen is employer as employee. It has always surprised me that he should be nicknamed the boss, but the implication is that this is an affectionate label, a brotherly way in which the E Street Band honor his sheer drive. In fact, boss is an accurate description of their economic relationship, Springsteen employs his band. He has the recording contracts, controls the LP and concert material, writes the songs, and chooses the oldies. And whatever his musicians' contributions to his success, fulsomely recognized, he gets the composing performing royalties, could in principle sack people, and like any other good employer, rewards his team with generous bonuses after each sellout show or disc. And, of course, he employs a stage crew, too, and a manager, a publicist, a secretary assistant. 
He has an annual turnover now of millions. He may express the feelings of little men and women buffeted by distant company boards, but he is himself a corporation. Springsteen is a 37-year-old teenager. He is 20 years into a hugely successful career. He is a professional, a married man, old enough to be the father of adolescent children of his own, but he still presents himself as a young man, waiting to see what life will bring, made tense by clashes with adult authority. He introduces his songs with memories, his life as a boy, arguments with his father, his mother is rarely mentioned, but as a performer he is clearly present in these emotions. Springsteen doesn't regret or vilify his past. As a grown man, he's still living it. Springsteen is a shy exhibitionist. He is indeed one of the sexiest performers rock and roll has ever had. There's a good part of his concert audience who simply fancy him, can't take their eyes off his body, and he's mesmerizing on stage because of the confidence with which he displays himself. But for all this, his persona is that of a nervy, gauche youth on an early date. <laughs> Those English know how to write. Springsteen is superstar as friend. He comes into our lives as a recording star, a radio sound, a video presence, and these days as an item of magazine gossip. Even in his live shows, he seems more accessible in the close-ups on the mammoth screens around the stage than as the real dim figure in the distance. And yet he is still the rock performer whose act most convincingly creates and depends on a sense of community. Springsteen's most successful record is live. What the boxed set is meant to do is reproduce a concert, an event, and if for other artists five records would be excessive, for Springsteen it is a further sign of his album's Truth to Life. It lasts about the same length of time as a show. There's an interesting question of trust raised here. I don't doubt that these performances were once live, that the applause did happen, but this is nevertheless a false event, a concert put together from different shows and alternative mixes, edited and balanced to sound like a live LP, which has quite different oral conventions than an actual show. Springsteen fans know this, of course. The pleasure of this set is not that it takes us back to somewhere we've been, but that it lays out something ideal. It describes what we mean by Springsteen Live, and what makes him real in this context is not his transparency, the idea that he is who he pretends to be, but his art, his ability to articulate the right idea of reality. I like that. The ability to articulate the right idea of reality, which, if I might bring it back to our present day, Americana, <clears throat> not to get political, but that seems to be the, um, the art of the moment, the ability to articulate the right idea of reality. True. The recurring term used in discussions of Springsteen by fans, by critics, by fans as critics, is authenticity. What is meant by this is not that Springsteen is authentic in a direct way, is simply expressing himself, but that he represents authenticity. This is why he has become so important. He stands for the core values of rock and roll, even as those values become harder and harder to sustain. At a time when rock is the soundtrack for TV commercials, when tours depend on sponsorship deals, when video promotion has blurred the line between music making and music selling, Springsteen suggests that, despite everything, it still gives people a way to define themselves against corporate logic, a language in which everyday hopes and fears can be expressed. If Bruce Springsteen didn't exist, American rock critics would have had to invent him. In a sense, they did, whether directly, John Landau, Rolling Stone's most significant critical theorist in the late 60s, is now his manager, or indirectly, Dave Marsh, Springsteen's official biographer, is the most passionate and widely read rock critic of the 80s. There are indeed few American rock critics who haven't celebrated Springsteen, but their task has been less to explain him to his potential fans 
to sustain the momentum that carried him from cult to mass stardom than to explain him to himself. I like that. They've placed him, that is, in a particular reading of rock history, not as the New Dylan, his original sales label, but as the voice of the people. His task is to carry the baton passed on from Woody Guthrie and the purpose of his carefully placed oldies, Guthrie's This Land is Your Land, Presley and Berry Hits, British Beat Classics, Edwin Starr's War, isn't just to situate him as a fellow fan, but also to identify him with a particular musical project. Springsteen himself claims on stage to represent an authentic popular tradition as against the spurious commercial sentiments of an Irving Berlin. To be so authentic involves a number of moves. Firstly, authenticity must be defined against artifice. The terms only make sense in opposition to each other. This is the importance of Springsteen's image, to represent the raw as against the cooked. His plain stage appearance, his dressing down, has to be understood with reference to showbiz dressing up, to the elaborate spectacle of cabaret pop and soul and routine stadium rock and roll. Springsteen is real by contrast. In lyrical terms, too, he is plain speaking. Uh, he is plain speaking. His songwriting craft is marked not by poetic or obscure or personal language, as in the singer-songwriter tradition following Dylan, folk rock, and his own early material, but by the vivid images and metaphors he builds from common words. <laughs> I, I want to read some of these comments, but I don't want to interrupt. But I just got Tom always has the best obscure ones. Uh, Tom says, Robert Crumb hated Springsteen. <laughs> well, we're not getting polemical. I just want to explore this whole idea of Americana. And this article, I think, is a really good um, uh, fleshing out of these themes. Mm. The vivid images and metaphors he builds from common words. What's at stake here is not authenticity of experience, but authenticity of feeling. What matters is not whether Springsteen has been through these things himself, boredom, aggression, ecstasy, despair, but that he knows how they work. The point of his autobiographical anecdotes is not to reveal himself, but to, but to root his music in material conditions. Like artists in other media, fiction, film, Springsteen is concerned to give emotions, the essential data of rock and roll, a narrative setting to situate them in time and place, to relate them to the situations they explain or confuse. He's not interested in abstract emotions, in vague sensation, or even in moralizing. He is, to put it simply, a storyteller. And in straining to make his stories credible, he uses classic techniques. Reality is registered by conventions first formulated by the 19th century naturalists, a refusal to sentimentalize social conditions, a compulsion to uh, sorry, a compulsion to sentimentalize human nature. Springsteen's songs, like Zola's fictions, are almost exclusively concerned with the working class, with the effects of poverty and uncertainty, the consequences of weakness and crime. They trawl through the murky reality of the American dream. They contrast utopian impulses with people's lack of opportunity to do much more than get by. They find in sex the only opportunity for passion and betrayal. Springsteen's protagonists, victims and criminals, defeated and enraged, are treated tenderly, their hopes honored, their failure determined by circumstance. It is in his realism that makes oh, it is his realism that makes Springsteen's populism politically ambiguous. His message is certainly anti-capitalist, or at least critical of the effects of capitalism. As both citizen and star, Springsteen has refused to submit to market forces, has shown consistent and generous support for the system's losers, for striking trade unionists and the unemployed, for battered wives and children. But at the same time, his focus on individuals' fate, the very power with which he describes 
the dreams they can't realize, but which he has, offers an opening for his appropriation. Appropriation not just by politicians like Reagan, but, more importantly, by hucksters and advertisers who use him to sell their goods as some sort of solution to the problem he outlines. This is the paradox of mass-marketed populism. Springsteen's songs suggests there is something missing in our lives. The CBS message is that we can fill the gap with a Springsteen record. And for all Springsteen's support of current causes, what comes from his music is a whiff of nostalgia and an air of fatalism. <clears throat> his stories describe hopes about to be dashed, convey a sense of time passing beyond our control, suggest that our dreams can only be dreams. The formal conservatism of the music reinforces the emotional conservation of the lyrics. This is the way the world is, he sings, and nothing really changes. But there's another way of describing Springsteen's realism. It means celebrating the ordinary, not the special. Again, the point is not that Springsteen is ordinary, or even pretends to be, but that he honors ordinariness, making something intense out of experiences that are usually seen as mundane. It has always been Pop's function to transform the banal, but this purpose was to some extent undermined by the rise of rock in the 60s with this claim to art and poetry, its cult building, its heavy metal mysticism. Springsteen himself started out with a couple of wordy, worthy LPs, but since then he has been, in important ways, committed to common sense. Springsteen's greatest skill is his ability to dramatize everyday events. Even his stage act is a pub rock show writ large. The E Street Band, high-class professionals, play with a sort of amateurish enthusiasm and affection for each other, which is in sharp contrast to the bohemian contempt for their work and their audience, which has been a strand of arty rock shows since the Rolling Stones and the Doors. Springsteen's musicians stand for every bar and garage group that ever got together in fond hope of stardom. How's everybody doing? We're almost done. This, uh, this is a long one, but I'm going a little bit long, but I hope you're enjoying it. <laughs> Paul Doyle, thanks. Thanks for the compliments. Um, and as always, when this is done, I will put this on my YouTube channel. And uh, if you know anybody that like is boycotting Facebook, I don't know why they would, but you know, I want to offer other places where they uh, could uh, capture this later, if they so desire. Anyway, onward. His sense of the commonplace also explains Springsteen's physical appeal. His sexuality is not displayed as something remarkable, a kind of power, but is coded into his natural movements, determined by what he has to do to sing and play. His body becomes sexy, a source of excitement and anxiety, in its routine activity. His appeal is not defined in terms of glamour or fantasy, the basic sign of Springsteen's authenticity, to put it another way, is his sweat, his display of energy. His body is not posed an object of consumption, but active, an object of exhaustion. I like that one. His body is not posed an object of consumption, but active, an object of exhaustion. When the E Street Band gather at the end of a show for the final bow, arms around each other's shoulders, drained and relieved. The sporting analogy is clear. This is a team which has won its latest bout. What matters is that every such bout is seen to be real, that there are no backing tapes, no fake instruments, that the musicians really have played until they can play no more. There is a moment in every Springsteen show I've seen when Clarence Clemens takes center stage. For that moment, he is the real star, He's bigger than Springsteen, louder, more richly dressed, and he's the saxophonist, giving us the clearest account all evening of the relationship between human effort and human music. To be authentic and to sound authentic is in the rock context the same thing. Music cannot be true or false. It can only refer to conventions of truth and falsity. Consider the following. 
Thundering drums in Springsteen's songs give his stories their sense of unstoppable momentum. They map out the spaces within which things happen. This equation of time and space is the secret of great rock and roll, and Springsteen uses other classic devices to achieve it. A piano-organ combination, for example, as used by the band and many soul groups, so that melodic, descriptive, and rhythmic atmospheric sounds are continually swapping about. The E Street Band makes music as a group, but a group in which we can hear every instrumentalist. Our attention is drawn, that is, not to a finished sound, but to music in the making. This is partly done by the refusal to make any instrument the lead, which is why Nils Lofgren, a lead guitarist, sounded out of place in the last E Street touring band and partly by a specific musical busyness. The group is tight, everyone is aiming for the same rhythmic end, but loose, each player makes their own decision as to how to get there, which is one reason why electronic instruments would not fit. They're too smooth, too determined. All Springsteen's musicians, even the added backup singers and percussionists, have individual voices, it would be unthinkable for him to appear with, say, an anonymous string section. The textures, and more significantly, the melodic structures of Springsteen's music make self-conscious reference to rock and roll itself, to its conventional lineup, its cliched chord changes, its time-honored ways of registering joys and sadness. Springsteen himself is a rock and roll star, not a crooner or singer-songwriter. His voice strains to be heard, he has to shout against the instruments that both support and compete with him. However many times he's rehearsed his lines, they always sound as if they're being forged on the spot. Many of Springsteen's most anthemic songs have no addresses, no you, but like many Beatles songs, concern a third person, tales told about someone else, or involve an I brooding aloud, explaining his situation impersonally in a kind of individualized epic. Listening to such epics is a public activity rather than a private fantasy, which is why Springsteen concerts still feel like collective occasions. How's everybody doing? Hey, and there's no, there's no criticism of Clarence Clemens. We're talking about creating the appearance of authenticity, which is it's an art. Okay, here's the conclusion. In one of his monologues, Springsteen remembers that his parents were never very keen on his musical ambitions. They wanted him to train for something safe, like law or accountancy. They wanted me to get a little something for myself. What they did not understand was that I wanted everything. This is a line that could only be delivered by an American, and to explain Springsteen's importance and success, we have to go back to the problem he is really facing, the fate of the individual artist under capitalism. In Europe, the artistic critique of the commercialization of everything has generally been conducted in terms of romanticism, in a state of bohemian disgust with the masses and the bourgeoisie alike, in the name of the superiority of the avant-garde. In the USA, there's a populist anti-capitalism available, a tradition of the artist as the common man, rarely woman, pitching rural truth against urban deceit, pioneer values against bureaucratic routines. This tradition, Mark Twain to Woody Guthrie, Kerouac to Creedence Clearwater Revival, lies behind Springsteen's message and his image. In this tradition, uh, it's this tradition that enables him to take such well-worn iconography as the road, the river, rock and roll itself as a mark of sincerity. No British musician, not even someone with such a profound love of American musical forms as Elvis Costello, could deal with these themes without some sense of irony. Still, Springsteen's populism can appeal to everyone's experience of capitalism. He makes music out of desire, aroused, and desire thwarted. He offers a sense of personal worth that is not determined by either market forces and wealth or aesthetic standards and cultural capital. It is the USA's particular account of equality that allows him to transcend 
the differences in class and status which remain ingrained in European culture. The problem is that the line between democratic populism, the argument that all people's experiences and emotions are equally important, equally worthy to be dramatized and made into art, and market populism, the argument that the consumer is always right, that the market defines cultural value, is very thin. Does that make sense? The problem is the line between those two things is very thin. Those piles of Bruce Springsteen boxes in European department stores seem less a tribute to rock authenticity than to corporate might. We are the world, sang USA for Africa, and what was intended as a statement of global community came across as a threat of global domination. Born in the USA, sang Bruce Springsteen on his last great tour, with the stars and stripes fluttering over the stage, and what was meant as an opposition anthem to the Reaganite colonization of the American dream, was taken by large sections of his American audiences as pat patriotism. In Europe, the flag had to come down. Springsteen is, whether he or we like it or not, an American artist. His community will always have the stars and stripes fluttering over it. But then, rock and roll is American music and Springsteen's Live, 1975 to 1985, is a monument. Like all monuments, it celebrates and mourns the dead. In this case, the idea of authenticity itself. Simon Frith, 1987. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. That was some food for thought, eh? And uh, I, um, I like that kind of stuff. I don't have to have an answer. I just have more questions. Um, well, I think that's, I'm going to call it. I have another story, but it's almost 930. And uh, I think you've suffered enough for one evening. Uh, thank you for joining me at uh, Selter in Place Storytime. Sips. And everybody have a sip. And we're going to continue on into the next week. I don't know what's going on out there. They're... They're like opening, opening stores and restaurants like a can of worms. <laughs> it's a, I'm not sure what the metaphor is or the, the image. Can of worms, herding cats, I don't know. But um, I'm going to uh, watch from a safe distance for a minute and see what, what goes down. And in the meantime, I'll keep working on my uh, live streaming. Uh, Shelter in Place every Sunday, Shelter in Place Storytime. Uh, Tuesday, I'm uh, going to continue with a weekly jazz workshop. Everybody's invited. That will be a, a Zoom conference uh, call format. So if you want to uh, participate in that, just send me an email, pksaxhq at gmail.com, and I'll try to get that together, send you the link, and make it work. We're working out the bugs on that. This week, we're going to continue our exploration of the use of minor pentatonic scales in improvisation. And then Wednesday, of course, is the ever-popular Space Force Jazz Lounge. So I hope you can join me for that and more later. Until then, keep your powder dry and uh, your spirits wet or whatever the saying is. <laughs> and I'll see you next time.